So welcome everyone uh, to this uh, talk of the AI uh, Colloquium series by the AI Center. This is a joint event together with the universities of Leuven and Eindhoven. So, and it's my pleasure today to, to introduce just Peter Katun. Okay, he's a world leading researcher in the area of model checking software verification and synthesis. And uh, he has been leading, okay, the group on software model and verification at uh, RWTH for 20 years, if I uh, remember correctly. And he will talk today about the topic of uh, facing uncertainty in AI from verification to synthesis, a topic that is particularly critical okay, for those of us who are trying to, uh, in, in this quest of uh, useful and trustworthy AI. Uh, the talk is going to be recorded uh, in YouTube. So, uh, and after the talk, actually, we're going to continue the conversation. In the next room, we're going to have some refreshments and something to it as well. So without further ado, okay, Mr. Peter. Thank you very much, Hector, for the introduction. Thanks for uh, uh, also the invitation to give a talk here. Um, I want to talk about uh, uncertainty in AI, and I would like to show you um, what you can do about this using uh, verification and synthesis. So um, uncertainty is ubiquitous. Um, if uh, you look at systems that have certain components, components may fail, and you would like to analyze what's the probability that the system is still up and running, let's say, within the next 10 days. Um, if you look at robot motion planning, like here on the grid, and uh, on equally polar positions, you have equal vis visibility, then you have to try to make a plan to leave this labyrinth at this position over here. And then it's all about how to deal with the uncertainty to get an optimal plan, for instance, to leave this within, a, let's say, a minimal expected number of steps. Um, systems that are autonomous, and you can think about the aerospace systems, uh, systems that uh, are due to security. One of the main key mechanisms to deal with security is using randomization. And there you have to deal with the uncertainty. You do not know what will be the behavior of your attacker. So the question is how to deal with this. And finally, autonomous systems, and here I have uh, just uh, autonomous cars that have to, let's say, adjust within a certain environment, but the environment is uncertain. You cannot fully observe the whole environment. So then the question is, how can you design systems that are safe, that are have a low probability of collisions and so forth? So the question that is at stake in my talk is whether we can guarantee that uh, AI systems are safe and dependable in the presence of such uncertainty. And the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to try to convince you that you can apply mathematical theories and methods for doing this. And what we in my group are trying to do is we strive for automation as much as possible. So push button technology. And let's see what that brings. So I'm going to treat three aspects of uncertainty during the talk. And this will also be a legion through the talk. In the bottom here of my slide, you can see what kind of uncertainty aspects we are considering, whether we are considering uh, randomization, um, aleatory kind of, uh, let's say, uncertainty, whether your system is moving in an environment and you have well, literally no clue what the environment is doing. And that means you can also not do sampling. I mean, you do not have a kind of a law of the large, large numbers applicable. Um, you simply don't know whether we go left or right, right? And then there is partial observability where we can see only partial things of the system, but not the entire system. Good. Um, so I'm going to co cover two, let's say, views on this. And one is the verification view. And there is that the idea that you have a model and you have a certain property, and we will see several examples of this, and you would like to check whether this model satisfies this property. Okay, so you give me a concrete instance of a system, you give me a concrete property, and I just would like to check, does that property hold on this specific model? And I would like to give hard guarantees. So it's not the case that we take a program, we run it for a million times, and then hope that in the 1 million plus first run, it also behaves safe. No, we would like to get hard guarantees that my system model satisfies this property. And in the second part of this talk, I will talk about synthesis. And here the setting will be that we will have a partial model 
So think about a model which has gaps, you know, like literally here, you have a kind of a program, but in the white, uh, let's say fragments, you have no clue what to write. You only know a skeleton of the system, okay? And now the question is, can I find the completion of this model? So I have to tweak in certain components, symbolically here given as A and B, such that this instantiated model, completed model, satisfies the property of interest. And again, I would like to give a hard guarantee. So in contrast to the verification setting, here we are not giving a concrete model, but only a skeleton. And here is a more of a design exploration, let's say, question. What kind of things do I need to add to my system? Do I need to add to my model such that the completion in the end satisfies a property? And we're going to see that this will be a more intrinsically hard problem, but still you can do interesting things. So let's start with verification. I'm a bit annoyed by the fact that this header is still gone, but um, okay, this slide was supposed to call verification. And we have a model, we have a property, and I would like to give hard guarantees. And uh, the way we're going to do this is a technique called model checking. And then the input is a system model and a property. And I just would like to know, does this model satisfy the property? And this is a, an approach that has uh, won several awards. And this is the idea. So we have a kind of an automaton model, a state transition diagram. We have a property that we typically cast in some kind of mathematical logical formula. And then we would like to provide a hard guarantee, does my model satisfy this property? And uh, schematically, it works like this. You have a model, a property. You put this into a model checker. This checks whether the property is fulfilled. If the answer is yes, you're happy. If the answer is no, the model checker is going to provide you with a counterexample, some diagnostic information that tells you how to fix the model. I'm going to explain you this by means of a toy example that you hopefully all understand, the wolf goat cabbage puzzle. We are on a riverbank. Right, there is a ferryman, there is a cabbage, there is a goat, and there is a wolf, and you have to bring them to the other side of the river. How simple can life be? Good. So how can we apply model checking to this? Well, we need those ingredients first, so I first have to explain you what is the model. Now, the model is going to explain all possible behaviors of this system. So this looks roughly like this, and the way to read this is that initially, uh, well, the cabbage, the ferryman, the goat, and the wolf are on the riverbank on this side, which is index zero. And now, for instance, if you go to the right, it means that the cabbage and the ferryman are going to the other side, and the golf and uh, the, the goat and the wolf are still on this river side, right? And then you can continue and you get all kinds of scenarios. Good. So this is the model, and uh, that's the initial stage, and then you would like to go to some goals. So what's the specification? So that's the next input to your system. A model checking query, that's the system property. So the property look, looks like this. So let me explain you this. So this is the target. The target says all objects need to be at the other riverbank, index one. But before getting to the other riverbank, I mean, the wolf should not eat the goat and the goat should not eat the cabbage, right? So if the wolf and the goat are there, you need to separate them by the ferryman. If there is a cabbage and a goat, you need to be separating them by the ferryman. Okay, so this said uh, this must hold until you get there. Now, I would like to show you how you can use a counterexample. So actually, I'm going to negate this formula. So I'm now going to check this is not true. And of course, we know there is a solution. And indeed, now the model checker gives you a counterexample because it says this property is not true. And then it gives you a counterexample. And this counterexample is the way you can solve this puzzle. OK, good. Now, this you can apply to very large models. And actually, industrial uh, things, although you don't believe me if I only explain this small example, uh, they apply this to industrial say, size uh, cases. Think about Microsoft. They check device drivers, companies that build devices that need to interact with the operating system, and they check them using, for instance, techniques like model checking. Facebook is, or Meta, I should say, is using model checking on a daily basis to check whether their code is still correct. And if not, the Developers get a message in the next morning, ah, you change the code, but apparently there is uh, some kind of problem. I want to talk about probabilistic model checking. This doesn't mean that the model checking process is probabilistic, but it means that the input is a probabilistic model. We want to deal with uncertainties. And the output is the probability of the property of that model. So this is the setting. You have a kind of a model, and we will see some examples. We have, again, a logical formula. And now I'm interested is the probability that this formula holds exceeding a certain threshold. Okay. 
Good. Um, so how does this work? Well, roughly it works as follows. Um, there is a model description. We start with a description in some kind of input language. This could be a Petronet. It could be a fault tree. It could be a program. It could be a UML diagram. I mean, some kind of input formalism, and some people even use it in biology. And then the idea is first that we build a model. And don't think that this is easy. This is most of the time the bottleneck uh, because these models can be huge. So we want to squeeze them. We want to make them smaller. And if that's the case, then actually we would like to analyze them. So we have generated such a model. Again, a state transition diagram, but now with probabilities. We now give a property. So this says, is the maximal probability to eventually reach the target below a certain threshold? And we put this into a probabilistic model check. Let's say the randomized yeah, analog of what we just have seen in the golf, world, uh, the golf, uh, uh, the wolf, goat, and cabbage problem. Okay, um, and then you can get output. So the output can then be a counterexample. So why is this property violated? Or it tells you, well, this property is violated, but this is actually the precise value. So we compute these values. And even for certain procedures, we're able to give you a certificate that even proves that this, that this is a correct result. And then we can also produce curves, like here is a Pareto curve that you can automatically get out of such a tool. And this is what I would like to explain you a little bit more in detail. Good, and the example that I'm going to use throughout the rest of the talk is an example called self-stabilization. And this is a, a process, uh, we have a distributed system and a protocol, think about an algorithm that works on such a distributed system is called self-stabilizing. When started from some possibly illegal state, it returns to a legal state, uh, let's say a desired state, right? And it should do that within a finitely many number of steps without any outside intervention. So it's not the case that somebody from outside can push a button and say, now we have to change this. No, it should be self, let's say, stabilizing. That's the idea. Um, Dijkstra in uh, 1986 proved that this in a network that is anonymous, what does that mean? It means you are not allowed to use the identity of a process. This is not possible. Okay, so you cannot solve this. But then uh, Ted Herman showed, yeah, you can solve this if you use uncertainty, if you use randomization. So this works as follows. So we have here a distributed ring. So every circle is one process and you can only send messages in a clockwise manner. Okay, every process has a Boolean value, green or red, and you have access to your own value as well as the one of your left neighbor. That's the whole upset setting. Good. Um, and then this is the algorithm by Hermann. It fits really in two lines. So what does a process do? If your value is identical to the one of your left neighbor, then you set your value, you flip basically a fair coin and set your value to zero or one. Okay, so you inspect the value of your left neighbor. Is it the same as yours? Flip a coin and then either get zero or one. If your value is different from your left neighbor, then you just copy the one of your left neighbor, which means you flip your value. One becomes zero, zero becomes one. And then we are going to say, if this happens, then you also have a token. Good, so I show you this. This is in one configuration. Uh, you see uh, this one has a token. Why? Because its left neighbor is colored the same. Okay, and this also holds for the other. That's the current configuration. So what does the algorithm do? You toggle all the processes without the token. Yeah, because they have a value which is different from your neighbor. So that means that this process has no token. It becomes green. This process becomes red and so forth. Then uh, you flip a coin. All the processes that have a token, the black dot, they flip a coin and this gets green. Uh, this one was red and remains red. And this was green and, re and becomes uh, red. And now I distribute the tokens again, and this is as follows. So now I assign the tokens and you see this is the only process which has the same color as its left neighbor. So we have one token. And this is actually the desired situation. We start with a configuration with three and we go to one. Of course, I engineered the example so this is the case, but in general, of course, this is not the case. So what's the question at stake? What is the expected number of steps until I get one token? Depending on the ring size. Good, you can put this into a model checker. This is what people in Oxford did. Here you see the size of the ring. Here you see the size and number of states of the model. And this is the number of transitions. And what you see, this model only has randomization, no partial observability, no non-determinants, right? 
and you get curves like this. So here you see different ring sizes. Let's pick one, for instance, this one, and you see that this curve goes down, it goes up at three, and then it goes down. And it took, was it about 15 or 20 years until somebody was able to prove that the worst case expected stabilization time is actually this function in terms of the size of the ring. Okay, keep this example in mind because it will reappear a couple of times. Good. So what is inside such a probabilistic model checker? There are actually various things inside. So we need to compute with probabilities. So how do we do this? We have to solve linear equation systems, linear inequation systems. Um, we have to do a lot of graph analysis, um, not only computing strongly connected components, but much more involved uh, graph analysis uh, things. We use satisfiability checkers. Um, a lot we use model abstractions because this model is way too big to analyze. So what we would like to do, we would like to be able to simplify this model such that if we analyze this simplified model and we deduce that this model satisfies this property, that then we can conclude that the large model also satisfies the property. And that's the idea. We use symbolic data structures um, and we use quite a bit of automata theory. Good, so let me start with a very simple example. This is a Markov decision process. In this state, you have to choose between either taking beta, which leads you to the red state, or choosing alpha, and then with three quarters, you go back, and with a quarter, you go to the blue state. Yeah, so in the yellow state, as well as in the blue state, you have to choose alpha or beta. This model has randomization as well as non-determinism. Good. Um, what is the controller? The, you can, you can, the controller can see the sequences of the states. So it can see you have visited this one three times, then twice this one, and here apparently at some point you decided to go to the green state. And then you stay there. That's the VV v, v dot dot. Good, what's the probability? Well, it depends on how you resolve the non-determinism, right? So the maximal probability is actually one. Um, and the minimal probability is actually zero. Why is the minimal probability zero? Well, in this state, you can immediately go to the red state and from there you can never reach the green state. And uh, the maximal probability is one because uh, you basically can take infinitely many times alpha that leads you here. And in that state, you get to beta. Yeah, so there you get the one. Good. Um, you actually can compute these things in polynomial time. Very easy, very efficient. Good. What's the key? The key is, and this is the most technical slide, I'm sorry about this, but this is all about computing least fixed points. So we have a function that maps functions to functions. We start with some uh, zero vector and then we iterate. And we iterate this function phi. What is this function phi? It depends on what you're doing. Either you do a vector matrix multiplication or a matrix vector multiplication, or you would like to compute something with a Bellman operator. Okay, I'm not going into the technical details here. But what is the key point here is the problem is when to stop. I mean, I do this, but at which end do I need to stop, right? In order to get my hard guarantee on my final result. So this is the picture. This is uh, just a Markov chain. You start in the yellow state and you would like to reach the green state. This is the true probability, but this is uh, something we don't know. Okay, now we compute this iteratively. What does that mean? We compute this yellow curve. Now, at some point, we need to decide when to stop. Yeah, you would say, well, you just compare to the green thing, but that's something we don't know, right? So what do you typically do? Well, you just compare two successive vectors and you check whether they are epsilon apart. But this is uh, not uh, completely correct. So what you need to do is you need to use dedicated, efficient techniques to guarantee that your result is correct up to epsilon. Good, so here you see uh, some results from a very recent paper where people try to use several techniques. So the techniques I just showed you is called value iteration, this iterative technique. And now you might say, well, Jos Peter, why don't you use a standard LP solver like Gurobi? And here you see two different implementations. So we check this on many different benchmarks and you see we still get cases where you get wrong results. So that apparently does not always work. Also here you get some wrong results, but at least you are able to, uh, to solve almost all cases. Here you're not able to solve all cases. And here if you could use SOPLEX, which is also a dedicated package, well, this uh, sometimes gets uh, less than zero results if you use exact arithmetic, but then you have to pay the price that you cannot solve, uh, let's say half of the instances. 
So people developed in this field uh, dedicated algorithms. It's called uh, optimistic value iteration or variants of this. And here you see a plot indicating this. This is um, a plot on the x-axis that tells you the number of uh, instances that you can solve. In, and on the y-axis tells you in what amount of time, log scale. So the lower the plot, the better. Yeah. So what you see here is a uh, LP solver. This is Gurobi. Uh, this is policy iteration. And this is value iteration. And what you see is the yellow curve is the right one because that gives you, as I show on the next uh, dot, zero wrong results. So without, let's say, a lot of extra effort, you can actually solve uh, things correctly uh, if you use dedicated algorithms. Now, these are the kind of things um, that we try to work on uh, to make to provide hard guarantees on these kind of results. Good. OK, and this is faster and more reliable than off-the-shelf solvers for linear equation systems and LP solvers. Now, I don't dare to tell me this, uh, this my colleague Lübeck, but uh, in this, in this uh, context, this, uh, this is the case. Good, we did some experimental configurations or comparisons um, with models with up to so many states and so many transitions. And uh, this is what you see. Again, the same kind of plot, the number of benchmarks you are able to solve in the amount of time. And here you see four different model checkers. The two blue curves correspond to the model checker storm that we developed in Aachen. And uh, actually uh, this lower curve is thanks to a kind of small AI engine that we use to basically guess the optimal user settings. And uh, that uh, performs actually uh, very well. We also worked on uh, multi-objective model checking. And here you see the blue, the red curve, which corresponds to storm. And also here you see a, a substantial improvement with respect to, to state of the art. Good, I would like to show you the effect of this on a real life case study. And uh, this is from a case study that people in Berkeley developed uh, together with Boeing. It's about the system and we will see this in a minute. Um, the system is uh, observed and then you would like to develop a monitor that continuously monitors the system, uh, tries to basically guess the state of the whole system. It's called state identification. Um, and I'm going to show you what you can do with model checking. Good. And the property is uh, an airplane should not collide with cars on the runway, for instance. Good. So what's the setting? This is the setting. We have an airplane that's landing on this thing. You see here uh, uh, an on-ground vehicle, here another one. Um, and this is a perception module that actually via which this airplane yeah, can perceive the environment. This can be either let's say fully observable, but it can also be noisy. And we will see the effect of this in a minute. And then uh, what you can do is uh, you can build uh, something like a model. This is actually a model built by Boeing. So what you see is here the plane in a certain vicinity. So 10K and some point 5K. Here you see the vehicles like near, entering, I mean, almost here the, uh, uh, the, uh, the landing plane, the landing stuff and so forth. And here you see 5K and so on. And you see that here continuously, this is monitored. Yeah. And what these people did in Berkeley in the group of uh, Sanjit Sesha was to try to see whether you can also use uh, probabilistic model checking in this project. And they, uh, these are the results. So they used uh, our model checker. They used several scenarios. I will explain you this in a minute. Here again, you see the, uh, the size of the MDP, the number of states, number of uh, transitions. They look at traces of a particular length. So you observe the system for a certain length of your history. And on every time step, you need to make, you have to observe, estimate the state of your system. That's what it does. Um, here you see the, uh, the state estimation. And here you see the results with model check. So let me say a bit on this. This is the, that if you use perfect sensors. So if you use perfect sensor, actually this filtering, kind of Kalman filtering that these people used, it's quite good and uh, yeah, it's better than, than using model checking. But here, I mean, the model has uh, noisy sensors. They model this by, let's say, a stochastic model of those sensors. And here you see that uh, this approach by doing continuously model checking these properties. So what does this say? This basically means you have to do, uh, N is uh, the length is 50. And then every model checking query takes so many seconds. And then uh, what you do is you try optimally, basically try to identify the, yeah, the state of the system. Good. Um, so far about the verification part. Now I would like to get to the second part of my talk, synthesis. Okay. So what is here? The input, a partial model of the system and a property. Good. So the property is there because 
we believe that we know what the prop, what the system needs to, let's say, uh, guarantee. But the model is only there in a sketchy form, a skeleton, yeah, a template. And then we're interested in, for instance, the output. Give me a concrete model that satisfies this property. One instance that does the job. But you may also ask a question like, give me all concrete models set doing the job. Or you may even ask, what's the optimal model? Whatever optimal means in terms of cost, in terms of better, in terms of a higher probability, and so on. Good. So that's the question that is at stake. We are given such a partial model, a model with holes in it. And um, what we would like to establish is a completion of this model that satisfies the property. And again, I would like to be able to give hard guarantees. No statistical guarantees, no guarantees that you get by testing. I really would like to get hard guarantees. They could be lower and upper bounds. That's okay. But then these lower and upper bounds should be sound in the sense that the real value should be between those lower and upper bounds. Not with a certain probability, no, with 100% confidence. Good. And this is a kind of design space exploration. Good. Um, so these are the kind of problems. So think about two parameters. So we have two holes in the system. One is on the y-axis, one is in the x-axis. And suppose they are real valued values. Then one possible way would be, well, you would like to find one point for which the specification is satisfied. That means you need to look for one green point. This is one question. But as you see, this is already uh, not so easy. Then you might be willing to ask something like, I give you now a subset. Uh, can you check for me whether all instantiations in this subset satisfy my specification? So that's a somewhat richer question in a sense. Or you might say, well, I would like to exactly know which ones satisfy the property and which ones don't. So can you get me this curve exactly? So a mathematical function. Yeah. Uh, this turns out to be exponential number of parameters, so that's hard. Nonetheless, you can do this sometimes, as we're going to see. Um, or you basically would like to approximate this curve. Yeah, if you would like to roughly know what are the good instances, what are the bad instances. Good. Go back to my example. So this is the same protocol as before, but now I use a biased coin. In my example before, I had this fair coin with 50-50. Now I have this bias P. And the question that is at stake, which bias minimizes the expected stabilization time? The expected number of steps to get one token. Okay, good. Um, so you can synthesize this. And this is one, uh, uh, my former physician, Matthias, uh, uh, developed this. So we developed techniques to automatically synthesize these values. So here you see a plot where you see the bias on the x-axis. This is the expected stabilization time and number of steps. And here you see the different colors are basically if you increase the size of the ring. Remember, we had this ring. You can send messages in a clockwise manner and the size of the ring there. And the interesting phenomenon is if your ring is small, you get one minimum. If your ring is faster, you get two minima. It's still an open question to find a mathematical function that for arbitrarily n defines me where are those minima. Interesting challenge. Um, but this is what we generate automatically. So let me show you this by means of, uh, so that's the, the message, right? For larger rings, more bias. You should also see that this curve goes more to the left and more to the right. So more bias is better. That's what the curve says. Good. Uh, here are some numbers. Um, and you see, I mean, the kind of models that we analyze are half a million. Remember, I'm not analyzing a verification issue. I'm trying to find what is the optimal P, what's the optimal bias, right? And I'm not checking one at a time. I'm checking immediately. I would like to really know the optimal one. I don't get a precise answer, if you see here, but I get intervals. So here we get two minima, and I know that the two minima lie in those two intervals. And I said, as I said, the bounds on these intervals are sound in the sense that you really know that the interval, the, the, the minima are inside these intervals. Uh, and this is the uh, optimal expected stabilization time that you then can compute. And here you see the amount of seconds. Yeah, sometimes you have to be a bit patient, but yeah, let's face it, we're not checking one instance, you're checking a, basically a whole design space, actually with countably infinitely many possible solutions. So it's not an easy problem that you try to, to analyze. Good. Um, 
I now like to see, to show you a bit how you can apply this to models in AI. And the first model that I'm going to show you is in terms of Bayesian networks. And I just uh, put this slogan from Stuart Russell in this famous book on AI on Bayesian networks, right? They are as important as Boolean circuits are to computer science. Good. So here is a Bayesian network. Um, what is special about these Bayesian networks is that there are those parameters again, similar as I had in my algorithm. Here, there are basically unknowns, right? By the way, this is a model that basically checks pregnancy of cows, and it does so by means of a urine test, another urine test, and a blood test. And this basically says that if the pregnancy is yes, then you do a test and the negation, I mean, you get a negative test with a probability that we don't know yet. It's P. Okay, good. So what can we do with this? We can answer questions like, for which P and Q, for which values over here, is the probability that the cow is pregnant giving two negative tests is lower than 0.2. Okay, how do we compute this curve? We do this gradually. So this looks as follows. You start here and you gradually compute basically a curve like this. Okay, you might say, does this scale? Yeah, here I have some uh, examples where you see basically the coverage. So that's the coverage of such a two dimensional space. But now I have eight parameters. So I'm going to talk about eight dimensional spaces. Uh, and here you see the amount of time you need, again, in log scale. Um, and uh, what you see, of course, if you, if you need to fill this whole parameter space, then it takes you some time. But still, you're able to uh, deal with, uh, I would say, uh, rather complex Bayesian networks, which, for instance, average uh, Markov blank widths between four and six, which is in the Bayesian network world to know to be, I mean, not easy to solve. Let's put it that way. Good. What are other kind of questions? You want to maybe want to find one point. So then you can even do much better. Um, so here you see uh, several uh, Bayesian networks, so many parameters, so up in the hundreds, several one hundreds. And then if you do simulation like particle swarm optimization, yeah, then this is not a good solution. You need to really be a bit more clever. Uh, so things that work well are things like a quadratic constraint quadratic programming, or for instance, gradient descent methods. And there you see in boldface what is the best method for each uh, model. And the message that we get from this is that actually this improves existing techniques for parametric Bayesian networks by orders of magnitude. And in particular, it also is applicable to a way wider class of Bayesian networks. A way wider mean uh, you can have parameter dependencies, you can have dependencies up to hundreds of parameters. And uh, applying this, let's say, technique from the uh, verification community was really a kind of uh, an eye opener uh, that we can really solve these kind of uh, instances. Good. How about computing this curve? This was exponential in the number of parameters. Can you do this? Yeah, also this you can do for all kinds of Bayesian networks. Here you see the number of parameters, and you can even do this for 200, 400 parameters. You get uh, rational functions with polynomials with a very high degree, but you can then feed them to an SMT solver and get exact results. And even that works for, uh, I would say, uh, surprisingly large uh, Bayesian networks. The next model I would like to discuss is uh, partially observable Markov decision processes. So now for the first time, we will see the role of partial observability, in addition to non-determinism and randomization. Um, so the way to think about this is that uh, here you have a kind of a grid, you have a robot that has to uh, walk to the green state. But now it can only observe basically its, uh, its cells which are in their direct vicinity, but it cannot look completely to the left, neither to here nor to there. Yeah, there are some sensors, but they have limited visibility. Okay, Russell says we cannot avoid these models because the world is one. I'm not sure whether I agree with this, but the slogan is nice. Okay, what is a partial observable MDP? Same model as before, but now I colored the states. Yeah, I also colored the states before, but now I may have states that are equally colored. What does that mean? Well, it means that a controller can only see the color. It cannot see whether you're an S and T, you can only see you're in a yellow state. Okay, same target as before, you would like to reach the green state and you can prove that the maximum probability is a half. I get to this in a minute. Good, actually the semantics of this model is an infinite state Markov decision process. Why? Yeah, what is here? We start here, right? So what is my initial belief? I am in state S with probability one and I'm in state T, the other yellow state with probability zero. I know where I start. 
Now let's suppose I take this alpha. Then it means with three quarters, I go back to S and with a quarter, I go to T. So if I do alpha, which I do with probability one, my next belief is that with three quarters, I'm in S and with a quarter, I'm in T. Now I can repeat. Ah, now I can do alpha. Now you have to be careful. With three quarters, you do an alpha here. With one quarter, you do an alpha there. And this gives you the next belief. And so forth, and so forth, and so forth. This gives you this sequence. Until you are here with probability half, you are in the, in the left yellow state, or with probability half, you are in the right yellow state. Why do we get in a half and a half? Because it's symmetric. Yeah, but you get infinitely many states. And now I can decide, and now I can move here, and this happens with probability half. That's why I get a half over here. Yeah. But here I have basically full, full knowledge. And of course, this. Uh, and this is what you also get in this belief thing, you, the maximal probability is a half. So they correspond, but this is an infinite MDP, and this renders this problem to be undecided. Good. What can we do about this? Well, we have seen in MDPs, full observability, you can solve this in polynomial time. Now we have partial observability, undecided. Good. What is the practice? You're going to restrict the setting. And the setting I'm going to restrict is basically, I'm going to basically restrict the power of my controllers, of my policies. And we're going to call this finite memory. Good. Finite memory controllers are controllers that can only, yeah, intuitively speaking, look back in the history, but only for a finite bit. Three bits, five steps, seven steps whatsoever. And then actually you can prove that uh, the decision problem, does there exist such a randomized finite memory uh, controller is actually, it turns out to be polynomial equivalent to the problem we just have seen in parameter synthesis, namely find one point in this green and red plot. Ha, huh. so maybe we can reuse some of the techniques there. And indeed uh, you can prove that this is now ETR complete. So that solves the kind of open question in the complexity. What is ETR complete? ETR lies between NP and P space. And this means actually that this problem is equally hard to, to prove that uh, whether two polynomials have a common root or whether a given polynomial has a real root. Okay, so that's the kind of, hopefully gets you some feeling about what's the complexity of the kind of problem we're trying to solve. Okay, I go back to my running example. Hermann's problem. Good. We have already seen the version with bias. Okay, what I'm going to change now is the following. I'm going to allow my controller to have memory. What does that mean? I'm not going to have, let's say, a continuous number of values for P. I'm only having, let's say, 20 or 30 or 50 different coins. So I can select which coin I'm going to use. I have some memory. So I'm, I can choose which memory update I need to do. And I even can use my token status. Do I have a token? Do I not have a token? And so forth. So I have more information to build decisions, which means I can hopefully be more clever. So the question is, is the expected stabilization time now lower? Yeah, and the answer is yes, but there is a certain price to be paid. We have to compute these things. So how does this work? Well, and this is actually what, uh, the, there is a top-down method. I'm going to, to skip this basically, what, what we, because what's the idea? The idea is that you start basically with all possible models, you check a few of them, and then you hopefully, hopefully can decide that for all of them, this is not a solution. And then you check the rest, which is over here. And again, you try to split this, and then you're going to check all these possible controllers, and you're going to check whether they are correct or not, and so forth. So it's a kind of top-down approach. I don't have time to go into all the details. There is also a bottom-up approach. So here is the idea that you start with a few, but now you can basically rule out, you check one, sorry, of the 25. So you check one controller. You find out this is not going to do the good job for you. Then you can rule out all the other controllers which are here in the same column. Then you check this one. Apparently this doesn't work. So you can rule out this whole column and so forth until at some point you find a satisfying control. So this is more a bottom up, right? I start with one and I'm trying to enlarge this based on basically counterexample information. So here the counterexamples are very important because this verifier is going to check if this, let's say kind of Oracle generates one instance one point in this matrix, it basically checks, is this one good or bad? If it's good, you're done. If it's bad, it gives you a, basically a conflict, which is think about this as a counterexample, and you use this counterexample to rule out this whole column in one shot. 
Okay, so you try to prune the state space by using these counterexamples. Good. Does memory help? So here I we use this uh, Hamans protocol, and now we use uh, twenty five different coins, so twenty five different coin biases, um, and we try to use uh, one single bit of memory, the value of your token, or let's say uh, the value of your uh, of your variable in the previous step, and so on. This gives you in total uh, a design space of three point one million different controllers, and we're interested in finding the optimal, okay, or one of them. Good. So this has been implemented in the tool. The tool is called Paint. Um, we use this uh, model checker inside, but there's a lot of technology uh, inside there as well. And here are some results. So let me try to explain those results. So here are the synthesis problem. Feasibility means find me one controller that satisfies a certain specification. Optimal mean, means find me the best possible controller. And this last 5% optimality means try to find the almost best, yeah, up to 5% from the optimum. Good. If you use uh, this uh, top-down approach, this is not very good because you need so many iterations and it, this, this is the amount of time that you need to compute basically to solve these issues. So you have to be a bit patient about roughly two days um, and then you can give an answer. We worked on combining these approach and we were able over the years, and this is research for I would say six to eight years, to reduce this substantially to be able to compute these controllers in a much faster rate, in matters of minutes rather than days. And you can also get the output of the controller, which is the optimal controller to solve basically your, your problem. Good. Again, I would like to show you this by means of a concrete example. And the concrete example is a satellite swarm. So a swarm of satellites. Okay, so here we have several satellites. They're out in the orbit. They need to communicate to each other, but in particular, they also need to avoid collisions. So how does this work? This works roughly as follows. So we model this by means of such a partially observable MDP. Uh, orbit with a certain ratio, you discretize this up to uh, a number of steps. It's partially observable because a satellite can only observe its environment every 10, 50, 100, or 200 steps. So you cannot use, I mean, your information about where you are in the orbit in every time step, but only in certain, let's say, larger uh, time fragments. At every step, uh, a satellite can either uh, decide to stay in its current, let's say, course or to change course. And I think there are about 36 natural motion trajectories. So you have ten, you can select one of the other 35 and then move your trajectory. What are the objectives? You don't want to have collisions. So those satellites need to collide with a very low probability, or phrased differently, with a very high probability, no collisions. And you would like to minimize the fuel usage. When do those things use fuel? If you, for instance, change trajectory. That's energy consumption. So that's something you would like to minimize. OK? So it's kind of two objectives that you would like to establish. And this is how it looks like. Um, so this is where, uh, here you see those uh, black things are the satellites. Here are the different, of course, not 36, but those uh, motion trajectories. And uh, the satellite starts over here. And then uh, apparently here it changes, apparently there it changes, it goes there, it changes, and so forth. Yeah. What is this kind of a controller? This is a controller that uses no memory. Okay, so now the question is again, similar as before, can we build a better controller. Yeah. Good. So we try to uh, get more energy efficient controllers. Um, and uh, same objectives as before. Low probability of collisions, minimal fuel uses. So these are some numbers from uh, our experiments. Let me explain you this a bit. So here are the, is the memory less controller. The controller I just showed you on the previous slide. Um, this is the number of states, the number of transitions. This is the number of parameters, which is associated to the number of observations. And this is the amount of time that we need to solve this. Then you can uh, add memory. So here is a memory of size five. So now the controller has more information at his disposal to basically optimize its decisions. Of course, this comes at a certain price. These models become larger. The amount of time to analyze them becomes larger. I mean, here we go to, uh, what is it, uh, 370 uh, seconds. 
Uh, and these are the number of parameters or the number of observations. I think the number of observations comes from over here, about 1,000 or 3,000 or 7,000 different observations. Okay. And uh, as a result of this analysis, you come up with a finite memory policy. And if you look carefully here, you see less switches than in the picture before. And why is that uh, beneficial? Because uh, now uh, you get a 50% reduction in the trajectory length and the cost, I mean, the energy consumption. So by means of developing or designing, developing these kind of controllers, you can optimize basically the energy consumption in these, uh, in these satellites. So I hope this gives you some insight what you can do with these kind of techniques. I realize that I'm going towards the end. Uh, and as final bit, I would like to talk uh, three slides on probabilistic programs. And um, the way I want to introduce them is by, by this plot. This is um, a system that the United Nations used to uh, analyze seismic events on the globe. Okay, so they have uh, stations all over the globe. And uh, yellow means it's hard to see is that a real event happens and red means like here, you only see a red circle, there is nothing yellow in between. This means a false negative, uh, sorry, false positive. The system thinks that there's something happened, but nothing happened, yeah? And the United Nations was not so very happy with the quality of this system. So actually in 2018, um, there were people again from Berkeley actually, um, actually Stuart Russell was involved there. They developed this system called NetVisa. And if you Google this, it's very interesting because since 2018, the United Nations is actually diagnosing seismic events, uh, nuclear power, nuclear tests by, for instance, North Korea, uh, but also uh, other seismic events all over the globe, in our ocean, on Antarctica, by means of a probabilistic program. And that's, I think, very fascinating. Um, another example, um, this is a, a probabilistic programming language is called Scenic, that uh, actually is used to, define, um, to develop scenes for computer vision. Okay, so you have one program, and by means of this program, you can basically uncountably many scenarios can be developed or can be generated from this program. And what they do is they use this for training neural networks, and they use this for this squeeze debt, which is one of the most popular neural networks in the field. And they found out that you can actually generate much more effective uh, training sets if you use programs rather than individual tests to train your neural network. And the last example I have is a paper in science uh, about 10 years ago, where it's all about recognizing these kind of handwritten uh, characters. And they use this for uh, several different languages. Um, and they used a one-shot learning approach. And they compared deep learning, blue curves. By the way, the y-axis is the error rate. Uh, probabilistic programs, which are the, uh, the middle three uh, plots, and humans here on the left. And in their study, um, actually, it turned out that these probabilistic programs were learning because that's the essential effect. You learn while having more data um, is actually uh, very beneficial. Good. There are many probabilistic programming languages. I mentioned a few here. Um, and these are developed by companies such as Uber, uh, Pyro, um, but also uh, Stan, which actually is developed by a company that does uh, predictions of the auction market and so on. Um, and uh, languages developed by, uh, for instance, uh, um, Microsoft. Good. I want to show you uh, two examples. One example is actually uh, to generate uh, discrete samples. Why is this essential? Well, you typically would like to have a kind of random distribution. How do you compute these distributions? Well, you can, for instance, use them by means of a program. This is a fast dice roller. This computes, it claims to compute a uniform distribution. And the only thing it does, it uses a fair coin flip. Okay, you see there is a loop here. Uh, there is an N, which is an unknown. So this is a parameterized, uh, let's say, program. Uh, and it claim generates a uniform distribution. Now, you can analyze this by looking at one instance for N equals six, and you can try to analyze this. So you can apply a model checker. And recently, uh, one of my PhD students was actually able to improve the current algorithms, which are the yellow or the orange dots here, with a new approach, which is indicated over here, that can, let's say, accelerate this approach with orders of magnitude. 
And this is not only applicable here, you can also use this for stationary distributions in Markov chains. So in my view, this is a kind of a small breakthrough, but you can even go further. This is all for a fixed N, right? N is here on the x-axis. What happens if I would like to know the correctness of this algorithm for arbitrary N? But of course, I can try to prove this by hand, but can you use automation? And yes, you can. People in my group work on what is called a loop invariant synthesis. You try to capture the behavior of this loop in some mathematical sense, and then try to solve it, but now for arbitrary N. And uh, one technique that we're working on is the following technique. Uh, you guess a kind of template for your invariant, for instance, a formula like this. Then uh, you go to a synthesizer. What does the synthesizer do? Well, the synthesizer is going to guess you an instance. So it takes an instance. It's going to instantiate this template. If you look carefully at this template, you see variables like C, X, which are program variables, but you see the colored things, which are the template variables. So now I instantiate this. This is a concrete instance, a guess if you want. And now I discharge this guess to a verifier. What does the verifier do? Well, it checks, right? So it either checks and it can either tell you, well, this is a good one, or it tells you it's a bad one and then gives you a counterexample. What are we going to do with the counterexample? Well, we're either going to guess a new one or we're going to change the template and try to find out that our template apparently was not good enough to solve this issue. And what can you do with this? Now, suppose that we are able to solve this kind of invariance. What you can solve with this is actually programmatic synthesis. What do I mean with programmatic synthesis? Again, I would like to synthesize a controller, but my controller is now given as a program. So here is a very simple game. We have a one euro, which has a bias of P. So heads with P, tails with one minus P. And I have a two euro coin with a bias of Q. We're going to play a game. First, you're going to select one of the coins, non-determinism. Yeah, you're not allowed to gamble. You just use non-deterministic choice, which coin to take. Then you flip the coin. If this is going to be heads, well, you earn two euros. If it's going to be tails, you lose. You lose the game. Similarly with one euro and then, and so on. So you can model this by a program that basically says the following. This is the amount of uh, money you have looked so far. You would like to get, this is the budget you want to win. And, and uh, A is zero means that's the termination criteria uh, that if A equals one, it means that this coin you flipped, but it fl you flipped it on the wrong side. So what are you going to do? You non-deterministically select one of the coins. This is over here, if true or true. True means one euro coin, true means two euro coins. You do not have any clue with which probability. It's really, Non-deterministic. Okay, and then what you know is if you take the one euro coin, well, with probability P, your, um, your budget is incremented by one because you win, or A is set to one because you lose. And losing means you terminate the loop. And this is the same thing, but now for two euros. Question, how to maximize the chance to win? Can you give me a controller strategy that wins this game for arbitrary initial budget C and for arbitrary value of N, arbitrary value of P, arbitrary value of Q. Good. This is a probabilistic program. It's actually, if you look at it from an operational point of view, it's an infinite parameterized family of MDPs. Infinite because of P and Q, parameterized because of N. Yeah. So this is even harder problem. And we just showed recently in a paper that uh, just has been presented a few weeks ago that you can use deductive program verification to actually synthesize, I must admit, not fully automatically, you have to give me a loop invariant, but this policy, these red lines, you don't have to understand these red lines. The only thing is that it's not a policy that always takes the same decisions because you see, if you look carefully, if Q equals P, this one is true, but this one is true as well. So then actually the controller says, it doesn't matter which alternative you take, both are optimal. Um, and what is this? This actually uh, means that the optimal controller for this problem is this probabilistic program here. So you can synthesize these kind of programs by means of, yeah, deductive verification. This brings me to the end. Um, I think that safe and dependable AI is pivotal. I did not use examples like uh, Google cars crashing 
uh, classifiers of neural networks that uh, do the wrong classification if you perturb the input and so on. I mean, these kind of examples, I think, are all known. Um, so it's clear that if you use these kind of components in a safety critical setting, you need to make sure that they are safe and dependable. Um, I try to give you an idea what you can do to treat uncertainty aspects, non-determinism, randomization, partial observability, both from a verification point of view, as well as from a synthesis point of view. Um, I try to show you what you can do on, on some models like partially observable MDPs, uh, probabilistic graphical models, but also probabilistic programs, which are actually used in AI also quite a bit. Um, if you want to know more information, you can consult our webpage. Um, we try to strive for fully automated techniques, but many of the problems are undecidable, so sometimes this doesn't work, but we try to do as much as we can. We develop tools um, over the last 20 years, and what is currently what is currently in focus is that we also try to produce certificates so that if your verification tool says my probability is 0.72, that it also gives you a certificate why this is correct. You don't have to believe the implementation. No, you have to believe the certificate, right? And the certificate is hopefully then easy to check. Good, and that's it. Thank you a lot.